Just facilitating that. Oh. What's his name? Phil. Phil. Yeah, hi. Phil or Phil? Phil. 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 Thank you. So come back up and facilitate real quick so I can hear you guys about blogs again. Oh, okay. Well, these two ladies already told us about their blog. This is a connection between France and the United States. You don't have it yet. I asked them if they're interested in blogging. That's fine. And then we can keep going. So are you, are you interested in blogging? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you like to blog about? Um, I'm on my blog. Um, I'm just sorry. the thing is like how to overcome. Awesome. Yeah. I um, want to start an online community of all things fermented, mostly fermented foods. Awesome. Yeah. I'm just interested in starting a blog for um, my business for SEO purposes. SEO purposes, excellent. That's one of my benefits. Excellent. Okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I only live in Maitland, so it's not just that far away. Like horribly miscalculated, and then I got lost. And so anyway, hello everybody. I'm Beth Sauer. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand again. I know some of you raised it said you had a blog already. You actively have a blog. You're actively bloggers. <laughs> Excellent. Um, hands down. Raise your hand if you are. Well, you want to be here for more interested in blogging. So never mind that. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you're blogging. For a business specifically, not necessarily your passion, but for a business. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you're interested in starting a blog because you're passionate about something. Okay, cool. That's what most bloggers start with. Okay, so quickly about me. Um, I run the Florida Blogger and Social Media Conference. It's uh, one of the largest blogging conferences in the southeast. It's sold out, unfortunately, or else I'd invite all of you. But it's next Saturday. Is anybody in here going to it? Yay, are you? Yes. Good deal. Good deal. So I will see you next Saturday then. Pre party the night before they'd be left. If you haven't registered. There you go. No, I just was gonna go for the conference. Okay. Yeah, I have a lot of friends at Envy Labs and so we hang out with each other. Oh, that's where I work out of. Not Envy Labs, but Starter Studio across the world. Oh okay. Well yeah, I have been like been across it. Yeah. I just uh, I hang out with Greg Pollock. There we go. The, uh, there we yeah. go. Small world. So in addition to the Florida Blogger and Social Media Conference, I have an active blog. It's called Florida Swim Network. We use it as a business. Uh, so a lot of what I'll explain to you we actually do with Florida Swim Network. My husband's a swim coach. My son's a competitive swimmer. It made sense out of size by the pool. So I did what these bloggers do and turned it into a website. Okay, so first of all, the advantages of having a blog for you, either as a person that's passionate about something or wanting to do it for a business or for a nonprofit or for any other reason why you have a blog. So the first one is you can do it yourself. So it wasn't too many years ago when you and I would have to have a degree in some type of computer engineering or we would have to understand how to code in Java or all these different languages and so most of us would not be able to create a website. We would have to hire somebody and pay them a lot of money to do that. Companies used to spend lots of money hiring this outside expert to come in and develop their website. They can't make any changes on it unless they got that person back. Well through the beauty of blogging, you and I with hardly any experience can pull up a blog template and start blogging makes it very, very easy. If we want to make changes, we can change it. So it's really empowered all of us in this room. Now, if you also know coding, you like have a leg up on everybody because you can do lots of stuff, but you don't have to. It's pretty low cost. It can be absolutely free. Or you can be what we call self-hosted, which is what we always recommend. Self-hosting. Uh, people that want to do it for you are going to tell you it costs lots and lots of money. It doesn't. It costs less than $10 a month to be self-hosted. So really, it's very affordable. Uh, blogs are highly customizable. You all have probably, I probably estimated nearly 50% of the websites you visit are actually blogging sites. ESPN is a blogging site. Orlando Sentinel, anybody see the new launch of the Orlando Sentinel yeah. today? It's beautiful. They just changed to a blogging type website. They don't want you to know yeah, what it is, but that's what it is. Um, Target's shopping site, you go to target.com, it is a blog site. So. You look at lots of websites and not even realize they're actually blogging sites. So that means they can look like lots of different things. They don't have to look like a traditional blog like what you're probably thinking about. You can have storefronts on there. You can be a video blogger. You can be a podcaster. You can have a photo blog on there. So lots of different things. 
as I just said, photos, video, you can have a variety of content on your blog. That's one of the advantages of it. Who wants to make money? You don't? No? Two people in the room did not raise their hands. Are you like independently wealthy? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I raised my hand. <laughs> you, didn't. you need a new partner. You need a new partner. Oh, it's all right. I'm yeah. a slave. We've got a seat up here if somebody wants one. Yeah. Come on up. We don't bite. Well, what's today? Not on Friday. <laughs> so, at my conference next week. The how to make money off your blog will be the most popular. We've got three sessions on it this year, and that'll be the most popular sessions that anybody goes to. Every month to learn how to figure out how to make a living with their blog, or how to use it to bring in income. And if you have a business, it's nice to supplement that business through bringing in other income on your website. So there are fortunately a ton of different ways to do this. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. SEO benefits. Who said the SEO? Bingo. Yeah. So how does a blog help your SEO? So if you already have a website, all right, so I used to teach at Park Midland School, which is this cute little independent school over by uh, Penzian. And they had a website. They got very little traffic because they didn't understand why they didn't show up in Google rankings very high. They're like, well, we're the best independent school in Central Florida. We should be at the top of the rankings. I'm like, why do you think that? Because the way Google works, anytime a website changes, a mysterious, magical, automagical signal is sent for Google to come crawl your website or any search engine come crawl your website. And that then helps your rankings. The more it crawls your website, the higher the rankings. That's why you see these uh, websites like BuzzFeed. They're always being constantly updated. They're really high in the rankings. Not necessarily because they have great content, but because they're constantly changing it. So if you add, as I recommend Park Maitland do, which they still have done, but that's okay. Um, they add a, if you add a blog component to your site where that page at least is being updated fairly often, you're signaling Google or Bing or Yahoo or any of those to come across your site, therefore going up in the rankings. If your site doesn't change, I think the last that I heard was 14 days it will start falling in the rankings. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what I remember hearing. 16. Is it 16? OK. See? Yeah, Smarter people than me in the room. That's good. Yeah. No, it's just Google and Bing are like 16 okay. for sure. OK. And then others do less, because it's like keep alive. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you don't change, so people like, how often should I do a blog post? I'm like, well, at least every 14 to 16 days, at least. Uh, but the more you post, the more often your site gets crawled, the higher in the rankings it goes. It's just the way it works. <laughs> Um, and the nice thing about the blog is that you kind of become the go-to expert, whether it's you personally or the company that you represent. So the more you're seen out there as a leader in your industry, the more people are going to look to you and listen to what you have to say. So I'm assuming most people, when they have a blog, they want to have a voice, whether it is for a nonprofit, whether it is for some type of business, whether it's sunglasses, t-shirts. You want to be a leader in your industry. And a blog is a great, great way to do that. So for a blog to work, you have to have people visit it. So when I first started blogging, Twitter was kind of new. Well, it wasn't, but nobody really used it yet. I wasn't on Facebook yet when I started blogging. Um, so I posted a blog post. I'm like, ah, everybody's going to come see me. And nobody did. Nobody even knew about it. How would they know about it? How would they know to go to my domain and to my blog post? They did. The SEO didn't help because I didn't have any SEO at that time. So you have to be your biggest cheerleader, and you have to drive the traffic for yourself. That's where the social media comes in. You post it to Twitter, put a link on Facebook. There's a seat over here in the front. Our guys are like, <laughs> So it's the traffic. And you guys see what I did there? You like my clever pun? Yeah, drive, car, drive, never mind. Um, so you have to be your biggest cheerleader. Blogging is not easy. It does. See what I did there? Clever. All right. So you have to be your biggest cheerleader for that. You have to be the one out there saying, hey, I wrote this great blog post. You're going to want to read it because it's about this, this, and this. You have to get their interest to get them to come read it. So ways to do that, one SEO, if you have enough SEO, they'll find you on Google if they happen to be searching for that. However, we don't actually spend a lot of time talking about SEO at our conferences. 
simply because there are so many other great ways that you have better control over to do, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, all, blah, 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 blah. Um, email I have down there. Um, I was reading an article, 100 top bloggers gave their best tip to new bloggers, and probably the most often tip I saw was to start an email list. Start your email list soon. And I can tell you from experience that we did not do that soon enough with Florida Swim Network. Florida Swim Network, we've got like 16,000 fans on Facebook. We have, I don't know, eight or 10,000 on Twitter. We were just rolling in the fandom. People loved us. And we could reach our fans easily. Back during the Olympic trials, we were gaining like 200 new fans a day. It was great. People loved us. Our reach was like a million. And then what happened with Facebook and fan pages? Anybody? They did. You, my, my organic reach to my fans, I'm lucky if I reach 1% of my fans. 1% of my fans, I'm lucky if I reach. And we have a pretty viral, I mean, how many people like swimming in the state of Florida unless you really like swimming in the state of Florida? So, I mean, we have fans that really do want to see our stuff. We're writing about their kids, their high school swimmers are in the news, so people want to see our stuff. But still, we are only reaching like 1% of our fans. Why is Facebook doing that? I've read that, but no, I think it's something more than that. I think you were kind of to, right. To, to encourage uh, brands to present. Yeah, so I'm seen as a business, which I am. I mean, for some network, we monetize it, so I'm a business. So really, I was taking advantage of Facebook, if you can do that, by using their free format to reach and run my business. Facebook got smart and said, well, that's not really fair to us and our stockholders. So now they reduce my reach, so I am then forced to pay if I want to reach my fans. Smart marketing move on their part, horrible for me and other like bloggers that have fan pages because a lot of us don't make money and so it's a pain to have to pay for it. So had we started building our marketing email list sooner, we could then reach our fans much easier for free and be in control of what our fans see versus being at the mercy of Facebook. So start your email list soon. How do you create an email list? Have a newsletter sign up. Actually, I, the email we'll talk about specifically in just a few minutes. So I have down in here a green community because I have uh, the advantage of working with a lot of different bloggers in a lot of different industries. A lot of Disney bloggers, a lot of fashion bloggers, a lot of business bloggers. And I see some that are really, really successful. And then I see some that do great stuff but have nowhere near the success. So I've been trying to measure what is the difference. And I came up with it was the way that some bloggers build community. So if your clients, your customers, that is your community. People that read your blog, that is your community. People that have the same interest as your blog, that is your community. Those are the people you need to reach you. You need to try and start building them around you in any way possible. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that because I think by building your community, that's the number one way that you're going to find success and more traffic. People to people contact is not extinct, even though we're all on our cell phones the whole time. People still want to reach out, meet personally, as well as feel like they have a personal connection with you online. It's all about being authentic online. So I'm going to give you seven ways for you to be able to build community using your blog and social media tools. Everybody ready? Number one, photos. Raise your hand if you've taken a selfie in the past week. <laughs> That's it. Really? Wow. Somebody told me that selfie was a fad. They're probably right. This is disorder, no. <laughs> ah, <laughs> guess what? I'm going to take a selfie. What are you doing? I found that. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Yeah. So, selfie time. I always post so, let's see. And I always look horrible, and you guys always look good because my arms aren't long enough, so I'm always out of focus. And you guys are good. All right, in the back, y'all gotta wave. Oh, come on, people, wave. <laughs> okay, and then I'll do this side too. Wave. Right here, wave. Okay. So you'll see when I post it that I'm glory, and you guys all look great. So. Okay, so photos, photos, photos. This is Lou Mangella right there. Lou Mangella is one of the top podcasters in the world. He has over a million downloads a month of his podcast. Let me say that again. One million downloads each and every month of his podcast. He, pop, he writes and does a podcast on Disney. Well, do anything related with Disney, you have a built-in audience. 
But there are lots of podcasters that talk about Disney that do not have near the success that he has. Why does he have that success? We'll talk about that in just a minute. Because he's actually what I use for the example for the podcast. So Instagram is a great way. I love the Instagram community. You said you were big on Instagram, I right? IG. Yeah, yeah. 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 So IG. Instagram is good. Who can tell me the audience of who's on Instagram mostly? Young. Yeah, yeah. But define young for me. 18 to 25? Uh, I think it's more like 39 and under they're saying now. Okay. It's going up. Simply because parents are now saying, what's my kid doing? And then they're getting on it. <laughs> so I'm sure like what happened to Facebook when all the parents and grandparents got on there, the kids left. I'm sure the same thing will probably happen to Instagram. So just so you know, we're coming for you. Um, <laughs> so this is a new blogger. Her name is Monica Stone. She's a blogger here in Orlando. She's the yogi movement. And she obviously is a yoga instructor, but she wanted to create some community, not only for yoga, but also for the city of Orlando. She saw those two communities as hers. And so she went out and started taking, I don't, I'm not going to call them selfies, because obviously she had to have somebody take them, but she took pictures of herself posing, and all these different poses all over Orlando. And she was hashtagging yoga in the city. So she created that hashtag, and it caught on where other people in Orlando were doing the same thing and tagging her in it, where other people were doing yoga poses out. And so it kind of went viral from there. And so she was building a community through photos. And they liked her stuff, so then they went to her website to look. So think of unique social media campaigns that you can do specifically with Instagram. So build that community. So the second one is video. Who uses actively video in any, of, any capacity? Starting, good. Now, it can be your Instagram video, which is, what, 15 seconds. It can be Vine, which is six seconds. It could be full video, which is much longer. And, of course, everybody knows to turn it sideways, right? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, some people are like, what do you mean? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you film straight up and down, you're going to have these black bars on either side. It looks really awful. And so I'm usually at home in the mornings. I'm watching the today show, and they always show some viral clip. And I was so irritated when you have a little black bar with this little tiny strip of video. Turn it this way, and it fits all the editing programs, and it's a great way to make it look like you had a regular video camera. So video is what brands are especially looking for. You don't need to have a lot of fancy equipment. Um, I, with Florida Swim Network, use everything from my iPhone up to $5,000 cameras, so depending on our need and situation. So one of the best investments you can make, this is an iPad. And so Makayama is the brand of that mount. So you can stick it on a tripod, which makes all the difference. It makes it look like a real camera because there's no little jittery movements at all. So if you're going to film, stick it on an iPod. Then you can also look at this, put a zoom lens on it. You can put a microphone. You can also have, attach a light. So we take this everywhere. In fact, my husband took this to Olympic trials. We took it to the World Championships. And there he is on deck filming, interviewing Olympic athletes. So that was pretty powerful. And what was funny was the first year, so he took this Olympic trials back in 2012. And I was back home. We couldn't afford for both of us to fly out to Olympic trials, so he just went. I was sitting at the computer doing social media for Florida Swim Network here. We were following all the swimmers from Florida. Fortunately, we had Brian Lofty, we had Darren, Darren Torres. We had a lot of swimmers from Florida for our fans. <coughs> so he's out there. He's interviewing. And, you know, you have ESPN, you have Sports Illustrated, you have Swimming World Magazine. You have some of these big names that are much bigger, have unlimited budgets. NBC News, and you know they've got their big cameras there as we're going down the media line. And my husband's there with his little iPad, doing all that. And they're kind of snickering, like, oh, God, look at this guy. Who's, who's this you know, amateur that's here? What advantage did my husband have over portability, but mobility, but feasibility. close, yeah, feasibility. Yeah, it's much easier. Curiosity. Kind of thing. Uniqueness. Curiosity. Uniqueness. Now, what he had was he would finish this interview, and generally all the press, they're, they're actually underneath the pool, they finish with the swimmers that just swam, they need to walk back up on deck, look at the scoreboard to see how the next heat finished, and then they go back down and get the people that they want to interview. So there's about five minutes in between each. So as my husband was walking, he's emailing me the video he just took. And then when we come back, by the time he got back, I already had it posted on Facebook. Well, Swimming World News, Swim Swam, even Sports Illustrated, notice that ours were up sometimes hours before theirs were. 
So the next time, yeah, they commented. They're like, wow, you guys are fast. So, like, so next time at World Championships, there were actually three or four other companies that suddenly were using this exact type of PF. So don't underestimate being cheap. It can pay off. <laughs> and give quality video. It's HD. So it's just the same as what they have. So it's a very easy way to do. So very affordable. You have your iPad. They actually make the same thing now for iPhones. Um, so I plugged in the iPhone. Sorry. Whose iPhone am I? Do I have like yes. here? Um, I think it's mine. I should look at it. Okay. Remember to check it sideways. <laughs> do you want it? Yeah. Okay. Can I get an iPhone? That is cheap. So um, I was doing social media. I do a lot of freelance consulting, and um, Orlando Harley hardly to cover some of their events. And so we did it all on iPad. I'll show you a video that we did for them a little bit later. Um, oh, right here. Here it is. So shot entirely on iPhone, and then a GoPro. And they wanted a certain stylistic image for it. Any Harley fans in here? Have yourself a fan? So this was done on this free software on my computer. Just took a little going to YouTube and saying, how do I learn how to use iMovie? A few hours later, I was up and running like a pro. So we got very stylistic. We even stuck one on a drone, spin it up. So you can do a lot of stuff just on an iPad and GoPro. And it was good enough for Orlando Harley to pay us a lot of money to do it. So don't underestimate. You don't need the big fancy cameras. OK, so this one, talk about building community. This one uh, was in my house. We have a lot of animals. My husband discovered a possum in our house. It's like 10 o'clock at night. So of course I'm live tweeting it. My son grabs our iPhone and starts filming it. So like any blogger, I start live tweeting the opossum episode in our house. People are sending in suggestions with how to get rid of it. I am building my community. The first one was the sweep method. So I said, grab a broom, sweep it out. Yeah, that didn't work. So then tonight we'll try and cage it. I'm like, okay. I'm like on the couch like this. <laughs> and of course, I'm taking pictures, tweeting them out. So it was during this episode of live tweeting about the possum that I met one of the top food bloggers in the nation, The Little Kitchen. She's like, here's what you can do. So she gave this suggestion. We had had pizza that night, so we slipped the pizza box underneath to then drag it out. and made more often connections. This had nothing to do with my blog. I don't blog on that topic, but it was a fun episode of Happening Life. By reaching out to my community, I made so many more new friends, made so many connections that it was amazing. So never underestimate when an opportunity might arrive. Don't be afraid to grab that iPhone. So, community. All right, so the next way, live streaming. If I do live streaming in here, the wave of the future, do you? Right now. <laughs> right here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How 
many people are watching? <laughs> I don't know. We have no idea. 1.6 uh, no, million. 1.6 million, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question is, do you all have a live chat on your live stream? No. Oh, then you're just making a live television. So live streaming is not television. So keep that in mind. Any more than an interactive ebook is the same thing as a paper book. I mean, there's no advantage to having an ebook unless you can do some cool stuff with it. There's no point in live streaming unless you make it interactive. So uh, we do live streaming at Florida Swim Network. In fact, that's what we do is we live stream swim meets from across the state of Florida. We always have a chat room going. And this is building our community. We have the same parents that tune in. I've got a granddad in South Africa. Africa that tunes in any time his grandkids are swimming. We had grandparents in France that we got to wish Happy Mother's Day in French. I didn't, but the grandkids did. Um, we had a dad who was stationed over in India. He got to see his son, and so we dragged the son up and stuck him in front of the camera, and he was talking to his dad. He hadn't seen him in six months. So make it interactive. It can be interactive. What you're doing is you're building your community. We have a whole army of parents and grandparents out there now that love us because we connect them. They'll we fly from the University of Florida. We're partners with them, so we go up for every home swim meet. University of Florida has swimmers from all over the world that compete for them. South Africa, Italy, uh, Dio Rico tunes in late every night from Italy to be able to watch. And so he's always like, how's my son doing? I'm like, well, I don't know him personally. Well, does he look OK? I'm like, yes, he looks fine. So man the live chat. Make it interactive. Not only does it, we've had uh, People tune in. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a swim meet. They are not fun. I mean, it's just back and forth and back and forth. And unless your kid is swimming, you hear nothing about it. And usually it's like a minute and 30 seconds that they're swimming. It's done, and you got to wait another two hours. We have parents tell us that they just sit there and stay on the whole time because they're having so much fun with this live chat. We also have our commentators that will talk back to them, give shout outs on air. So. Make sure if you use live stream, it's a very powerful tool to build community. So there we are. Uh, in fact, it allows us to have an average of about 2,000 viewers per live stream that we do, turning into a swim meet. That's crazy. So Chef Dennis Litley live streams on Google Plus. Anybody try to get? Okay, Google Hangouts on air. That's what he does. Uh, he actually does three shows a week. He does a cooking show, does the Chef Dennis. The one you saw before was his social media show. And then he does one just because he thinks it's fun. He does like variety acts. How cool is that? I don't know where they were. But he has built this community to where he has half a million followers on Google Plus. He's a local guy, Chef Dennis Lindley. Be sure you follow him. But talk about building community in a relatively short amount of time because Google Plus is not that old. All right, podcast. We're back to Lou Mangiello. Anybody in here do a podcast? Thinking about it. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, they're great. Podcasts actually have a better return. Usually the listeners are more loyal than yep. their forms. So they're great. So Lou Mangiello of WDWRadio.com, another local guy. So Lou was an attorney in New York, hated the billable hours, said forget this, packed up his family, moved to Orlando, and spends every day at the happiest place on earth now, where he does a live stream as well as a podcast. And as I said, Began my presentation, a million downloads a month. He's a rock star. But there are other people that do that. So what is it that he does differently? He really works to build his community. He'll say, hey, guys, I'm going to take a cruise, a Disney cruise in November. Anybody want to sign up and go with me? And he sells out cruise ships. And while he's on the cruise ship, he'll do three or four podcasts and then play them later so that he has return listeners. Hey, guys, I think I'm going to run you know, the UCF road race Next month, if I want to sign up, we'll get t-shirts, we'll run together. And he'll get teams that sign up to run on his team, and he mobilizes them. They'll say, hey, guys, um, I've talked to Disney about running the room and having some of their cast come in and do a show for us. Anybody want to do it? So he's building his community in person instead of just relying on people to download it. Podcasts, while they're wonderful, you don't see the person there for the most part. So you got to mobilize your community by meeting them in person. Email, so email marketing. That's why I said I wish we had done the Florida Swim Network a little sooner. We were We were spoiled by Facebook. We were spoiled by Twitter with our success there. And then Facebook totally screwed us over. But I understand why. 
they're a company they need McKnight as stockholders. So we had to change our tactics. So now I'm suddenly backtracking, doing everything I can to try and get email signups. Mm -hmm. So we're at Meeks. We have the volunteer crew in person that say, hey, have you heard of Florida Slum Network? You can get information about your child if you sign up here. Hi. So we have in pe people in people in person people trying to sign up. Then we have uh, we give away a copy. My husband has a, a book um, that he wrote that's an ebook, so they get a free download of that if they sign up. Um, we put it. At, we have it automated to where every Monday you get whatever our latest posts are, so it's not a lot of work on our part. Um, Mailchimp is my favorite email service. It is free up to the first 2,000 uh, people on your email list. So as long as you're 2,000 or under, it's absolutely free. And they have some really killer, killer tools. So they are great. You can have the automated, so it's Mailchimp, Mailchimp.com. Um, and my favorite thing is after you send your your email campaign, the little monkey paw high fives you. And so quite literally, after it goes, for good luck, I always high five my computer screen. People laugh at me for that, but you know, knock on wood, it works. So, <laughs> but it's great. So um, I highly recommend getting your email list going from the very beginning. And so I say, well, I don't have anything to say before I email out to them. How about a monthly newsletter with your top five five tips? All right, mustache guy. Yes. What's your podcast going to be about? Um. So the, it's going to be related to my blog, which is what we're hoping to get out with. And we're trying to uh, talk about how governments are trying to act more like a startup. Excellent. So uh, a monthly newsletter about five ways that the government has done something wrong this time. Or, you know, five, five. Well, they're, they're going to be more positive. In <laughs> <laughs> you gave me the short description. <laughs> so think of creative ways, things that people, but you want to be a resource to them. So for my Florida Blogger Conference, we do a monthly email where we always feature one of the bloggers in the state of Florida. We get blogging tips on there. Somewhere at the bottom we'll promote some event we have coming up. But we want to be a resource. Anybody uh, subscribe to the Bungalower? They are a local blog here in Orlando. They focus on downtown. They're always with tips since I now work downtown. I find about road closures and things like that through their weekly email. So I'm like excited when I see the Bungalower come. When's the last time you were actually excited about receiving an email? Not very often. So your goal is to make yourself what they want to see in their inbox. And so we've had some success with that with Florida Slum, or sorry, with Epic BlogCon, where our bloggers look forward to seeing who's the featured blogger. And they give a shout out saying, hey, I just heard about you through FL BlogCon. Be the resource that people want to see. So for Florida Swim Network, as we've worked furiously to build our email list, we had to do that because we were going to be asking something of our fans. We have always live streamed for free. Parents don't have to pay anything to get on there and watch their kids and grandkids. We occasionally, well, University of Florida will pay, and we occasionally have a sponsor come in, but it was costing us a lot of money to do that. So we had to change our, our revenue model. So we switched to crowdfunding. So you can create a, it's called, oh, no, I can't remember, Ignition Deck. Ignition Deck, and it gives you a Kickstarter-style campaign on your own blog. So if you're interested in doing any type of crowdfunding, you have to do all the work yourself. It's called an ignition deck. And you can do that, and that's what we use on a site called Meat Starter, where we then fund our swim meets that way. Hey, parents, do you want to see your kids seen, swim at Senior Champs this year? Make sure you donate towards it. A little bit helps. So that's just another revenue model that we do. So community is important. So magazines, anybody do a magazine? This is a quick, easy one. Take your blog post. Cut and paste them into a Word document, export it to a PDF, upload it to Mag and Cloud. We have a monthly magazine, but we really don't. Mag Cloud, it's free to upload your PDF. They let you know if it's set up right, because people can actually order and print it if they want a print copy. Or they can read it on their iPad, in their reader, get to the bookshelf. It's a regular magazine. So we have a magazine, even though we really don't. That we're building our community. In fact, we sometimes have parents that think we're only a magazine. They don't realize we have this huge website connected to it. That's just another way for you to create community. Tweet ups. Have I been to a tweet up before? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I just hosted one last night at Quantum Leap Winery. Um, it's for our upcoming conference. And so tweet up is basically where you say, hey, everybody, let's do it together. And when we get there, we're going to socialize and talk face to face and face to face and face to face, and then we'll actually tweet out what a great time we're having. Make everybody else jealous that they're not here. 
And so you have the whole room tweeting about the same thing. You're creating your community. Take a hashtag, tweet it out there. So this one was a tweet up at Barney's Coffee Kitchen. Um, and then various other tweet ups. Um, so one thing that I've learned through my community building that I want to stress to you all. So I have uh, people that will be like, oh my gosh, Bess, can you retweet this with Florida Store Network or you know, with your Twitter brand or with uh, Apple Blog Com? Can you please tweet this out there and the listing? Um, well, it might work, but I may not be the most influential for your community. So if you're an entrepreneur, I think you would much rather have George Gramaticus talking about you, who is like one of the rock stars of entrepreneurship here. It's like three followers on Twitter or something because he's new to it. But if you were to look at his numbers, you'd be like, this guy's nothing. Never judge a person based on their online numbers. I see that mistake made all the time. <coughs> all the time. So don't make that mistake. Plus, there's the life farms you can buy yes. stuff all the time. So really, it's very, very misleading. So I mean, you can't really judge anybody based on their numbers, whether they're really high or really low. OK, so now what we want to know, show me the money. <laughs> How am I doing on time, somebody? What time is it? 22 minutes. 22 minutes. Excellent, yes. excellent. So money, ways to monetize. There's a zillion of them. I'll give you the main one. So banner ads, ad networks, mm -hmm. or newsletter ads. It's where you go, hey, our coffee, we'll put an ad for you on our website. Or, hey, food ad network, you can get any ads you want on my website. That's an ad network. <clears throat> or, hey, Barney's Coffee, and our newsletter that goes over a 1,000 bloggers here in the state of Florida, we'll put an ad in there for you. Generally, the banner ads that you sell yourself, such as the banner ads and the newsletter ads, you can put the price on it. You have to figure out what somebody's willing to pay for that. If you don't have high blog view numbers, that's the way to go. So hey, you know, 50 bucks, I'll put an ad on, your, on my site for a month. This many people will see it. Once you start getting to a high number of viewers, then you might want to consider switching over to an ad network. Ad networks pay for every 1,000 views. Okay, so if you have 10,000 views a month, they're going to pay you 10, that's 10,000, 10, one time for every 1,000. So usually they pay anywhere between $2 and $12 per 1,000 views. Most of them pay around the 2 to $3 CPM. That's called a CPM. So an ad network's not real great for people that don't have tons of blog views. If you have a million blog views a month, then it pays you very well. But if you only have 10,000 and you're only paying you two for a CPM, you're only making 20 bucks that month off of that. So you have to decide which one's best for you or maybe even a combination. Affiliate links. So Jay from Jay's Everyday Fashion. This is great for fashion bloggers, for uh, food bloggers, electronic bloggers. So an affiliate link means Amazon is going to give you a link that every time your viewer clicks and goes buy something at Amazon using that link, you're going to get a percentage of that money. So Jay from Jay's Everyday Fashion has made tons of money. It's her main money income. She will be wearing outfits, and then right underneath, there will be the link for the shirts, the shoes, the jewelry, the earrings. And she has yours that click and go buy them, and she just made money off every time somebody buys it. So affiliate links can be very, very powerful. And usually, you can find an affiliate link for anything. Yes? How do you set up a Okay, so most places, you can type their name into Google and put affiliate next to it, and they will take you to the affiliate link. Some places like ShopSense will set that up for you. So ShopSense.com is one that a lot of fashion bloggers use. Um, so generally, like iTunes even has an affiliate link that they don't like people to know about. Professor Josh just started using it. He's like, they have affiliate links? I can make money every time I recommend an app and somebody buys it? Well, it's not a lot on a two ninety nine app, but I mean, it adds up over time. So generally, if you put the name in and then put affiliate or affiliate link and search for it in Google, you're going to be able to find one if they offer. Sponsor posts, a lot of times contests, or giveaways. So this is when a company will pay you to write about them. So at Florida Swim Network, somebody comes out with a new set of goggles. Hey, we're trying to get word out about them. In fact, we just had this happen with the uh, kids' goggles. They're called Froggles. They're kind of cute. They're here, and they got all these things around that's impossible for competitors. So we're aware of it. It's kind of related. So we said, sure. Um, we charge $75 to write a post about that. And we tell people, 
we are being paid to write this post. They're like, sure, that's fine, because that's the way it goes nowadays. So you can do sponsored posts. I know people that make very good livings, but it is a lot of work. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of hustle to find the people that are going to pay them. A lot of times you do contests or giveaways. So Julie Diley of The Little Kitchen will do a lot of giveaways. Vitamix Blender. Blender costs a couple hundred dollars. Anybody have one in here? Do you? I'm jealous. Yeah, so it's like this really commercial, heavy-duty, great blender. And uh, so she will feature one on her blog. She'll show all these great things she can do with it, and then she'll do a giveaway. Well, she's being paid money to host that giveaway. But again, she has 600,000 visitors a month, so she can charge enough to do that. If in a sponsored post, like you don't control a lot of the content that goes into it, right? Say you get one of your friends who's kind of famous through light up Mm -hmm. Get sponsored posts for you. Right. Won't they get more traffic off of that because they're going to advertise and they're already pretty big? So you're kind of just doing them a favor, and if you're small, you're probably not going to get the same kind of views. Is that true? What well, do you think of your experience? Okay, so is the, the famous friend writing on your blog? Yeah. Yeah, then they're going to be sending people to your blog to read what they wrote. So that is good. Guest posting is a great way to drive cross traffic. Right. Would, would you end up still getting enough, or would they get a lot more traffic? <coughs> you would still, because they're, what they're going to be doing is taking the, the link from your blog and posting it out oh, there. Saying, hey, yeah, yeah. yeah, check where I guess post. Um, but sponsor posts can be dangerous for companies because you don't control what the blogger writes about it. What if Julie Diley hated the Vitamix? What if it broke halfway through? I mean, so you do have that danger that sometimes you can't control what they say about it. Social media campaign, we saw that earlier with Yoga in the City. You can do whole social media campaigns. We're doing one right now for Ford uh, called the Ford Selfie 14, where our conference members, if they take a picture next to a Ford, even if they don't own one, we encourage them to photobomb one and they tweet it out there, then they can win a GoPro. So, so cool stuff that you can do with them. Um, we are being paid to host that because they want to access our audience. Uh, membership sites. So the bungalow that I mentioned earlier is a membership site, $9 a month. Uh, to read their information, but it's vital information that I need. It's about road closings, road openings, detours, different uh, high-tech things opening downtown Orlando, those types of things. So it's worth it to me to pay the $9 a month. Membership sites are becoming more popular, but you really have to have good info for people who want to pay for it. The sponsorship marketplace is where you take your blog and you go to a company like Isia. You're like, hey, Isia, I would like to uh, do something with you guys. Can I? And they will actually go out and find the company to work with you. A storefront, if you want to sell something, you can open up a storefront. There are plenty of plugins that you can put a storefront. You can sell t-shirts, you can sell electronics, you can sell software, you can sell apps right on your blog. There are plenty of payment gateways that solve that. You can do PayPal, you can do Stripe, you can do credit cards if you figure out how to become accredited for them for, through a bank. But there's WooCommerce, there's all sorts of plugins that help with that. I, I know I'm in the minority. I think there's only one other guy that said blogging for their business. Mm -hmm. How does this technically apply for like uh, not business to consumer, but business to business? Okay, so business to business, um, banner ads. Obviously, if you have something that's going to be sold to both of them, you might get that. Um, affiliate links if you're selling a service for them. Oh, so, not, not like that. But um, so product, um, so solar cells. Okay. I'm not going to be selling them to everyone in this room. I want to sell them to Solar City or someone like that. Okay. So if I'm doing a blog, I'm doing it to that other solar yeah. cell company. So there. what are you going to be telling them? Why do they want to buy your solar cells? A um, million different articles about how solar cells. So you just have a million different blog posts. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, and that's not the challenge I'm thinking of. But like, how are you selling that to someone like Solar Cell, Solar City? How are you blog? selling your blog post to them? Not selling the blog. How are, they, post, are you getting it to them to see? Uh, getting it to them to see how my how do you write a blog post that encourages Solar City to want to do something like to purchase? Um, why don't we talk afterwards since that okay. one's a little more specific? And um, then you can organize and host offline events. Um, we have bloggers that uh, will be paid by a store to bring in a crowd of other bloggers for a like the Barney's Coffee event. The lady that organized that was paid by Barney's Coffee. Um, there are Twitter parties that companies will say, hey, we've got a new kids game coming out. Will you have a Twitter party talking about it? And they get paid to do that, miraculously enough. And then crowdsourcing again. Yes? Uh, so generally, like in the history of the internet, I feel like companies are waking up to the ROI that they can get with yes. working with bloggers, working with social media people. Yeah. But 
are you finding that companies are doing more of the legwork to actually reach out to the bloggers, or are bloggers doing the legwork? Um, I think both. Um, part of my job is educating both ends. So I will have not only bloggers at my conference, but I have plenty of PR people that are there to meet bloggers and figure out how to work with them. So it's, it's a coming together on both ends. Yeah. yeah, and so it's education on both ends as well. Um, so if you want to monetize, the first thing you got to do is have the numbers. Nobody's going to pay if you don't have anybody to read your website. That seems obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many bloggers try to sell an ad before they have any readers. Mm -hmm. You have to have some readers first. I use the newsletter model. If you start a neighborhood newsletter that you print, it goes out to 10 homes, well then you have 10 readers. If you grow that to 100 homes or to 1,000 homes, somebody's going to pay a lot more than for the 10, so you've got to work on it. Um, create a media kit. So a media kit is a very specific, uh, very specific, specific format with blogging. I'll show an example in just a minute. Um, you must have the FTP requires you put disclosure on there that you do take sponsored posts. It's kind of like truth in advertising. Julie Diley is not going to talk about how wonderful that Vitamix lender is without saying, by the way, I'm also being paid to say this. However, my views are my own. I could have paid it as well. Um, you do need to have a privacy policy page, especially if you're collecting information like emails about it. Um, a really easy way to do that is to type into Google sample privacy policy. There are tons of them out there. Seriously, you cut and paste it because they all say about the same thing. And unless you're an attorney, you use one that somebody has already used. They actually put them out there and say, here, use this for your privacy policy. Um, and then don't just cold call companies. Actually develop the personal relationship first. I never approach a company to ask them to do anything with us that I don't know the PR person first. I've either met them first, talked to them first, in some way. So here's my uh, sample media kit. This is our actual media kit for Florida School Network. So um, this page one is actually a, a four-page media kit, but I didn't, you get the gist of it. So we put our, our website here. Over here is kind of the highlights of what we do. Always have all your social media numbers, because generally that's even more important than your blog numbers because you have a far greater reach. Um, and then we say the different ways that they connect with our readers. And then I go through it specifically. So for our website, I show them the two places they can put an ad. I give them our view numbers. We only have 45,000 views. That's not a lot in the blog world. But coupled with our Facebook and Twitter reach, it can add up to a lot. Um, weekly newsletter they can advertise in, quarterly magazine. So we adjust our numbers. We're constantly updating this based on our numbers. And so, of course, the more you grow, then you can do the math on it to whether it works out. So this would be what I would send to somebody to say, hey, we'd love to have you advertise with us. Take a look and see if this can work for you. Mm -hmm. um, as you're starting out, um, and I do know about Suite, but how do you go about managing more than, do you, is it worth paying Suite to manage? Um, no. Um, Hootsuite, I would suggest only use for Twitter. Only one of them. I love for Twitter. So um, I think, was that the question you had? Yeah, so every, it takes work. So my day lives with Facebook and Hootsuite Open. My husband manages Instagram, because I personally hate Instagram, so he does the Instagram for us. Um, we both do Pinterest only by uploading the pins. We rarely repin or just spend time on that. Um, the live stream takes care of itself when we're live streaming and then YouTube when we upload to it. So pick the ones that you're best at and then live in that space. If you're in Hootsuite, don't automatically post to Facebook because it's a different audience. Actually, be on Facebook. It doesn't take that long to pick the tab over and look at it. The people who are on Twitter are expecting a Twitter conversation. My best example is, guys, you probably don't do Pinterest that much. Right? I love Pinterest. Ladies, you probably don't do Reddit that much. Am I right? Yeah. So why would you ever post something to both places? They expect the same reaction. So live in each space individually. It takes a little more time, but not that much. And the payoff that you get will be better. All right, so group work. Real quick, because I'm running late. Here we go. So Limitless. Have you all heard of Limitless? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just heard them present the other night for the first time. I was fascinated with I'm like, this is awesome. So raising awareness and funding for those with limb loss is our mission. Building relationships through charitable activities and assisting adaptive sports is key to our success in helping the kids grow and develop new ideas. We believe in improving the quality of life for patients with limb loss plays a pivotal role in the development of their lives and maintaining a positive outlook and tackling all the challenges the world has offered. Basically, they helped this kid who lost his arm, could not get a new prosthetic, they got one for him. They created it, and now they're talking about printing 
the limbs off on 3D printers, having designing cool things like the Wolverine hand, Transformer. I mean, what kid wouldn't want that? You know, it almost makes losing your hand kind of cool. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that. I lost a fingertip. Uh, in fact, when I post about later, somebody said, are they printing you a fingertip? So anyway. Um, so they, when they presented the other night, they said, we're just starting out. We're what, an engineer, a designer. We don't know anything about business. Don't have a website yet. So you all brainstorm. If you were a social media person advising them, what sort of things could they do? Like on their website for a blog. Would a blog be beneficial for them? Hands up. Anybody? Yeah. OK. What sort of things should they have on that blog? Pictures. Okay, pictures of what? Pictures of the prototypes or happy clients. Cool. Prototypes, happy clients. They can have um, Instagram pictures, and even though it's not the it's not the final product, but they can Photoshop like a Wolverine hand with a kid they and post that, and, and that would really go viral. Like that. I think it would too. Yeah, that would be an excellent. A whole Instagram photo speak volumes. Oh, maybe like featuring someone who has their product and how they're like going about their daily life being awesome. So they could even do whole little profiles of patients that they've helped. Yeah, maybe even so video cool. stories about them. Okay. With, um, just posting the um, actual story or testimonial of the people? Yeah, I think so. I think a little profile for each person they help. Absolutely. So they need some, they have no revenue model right now. Nothing right now. That's what they're trying to figure out right now. And they're hoping to get lots of people involved with printing. They said, even if you at home have a little personal 3D printer, maybe you can be in charge of printing fingers for us. And then we'll put them all together. So how can they show that? through their website. What else can they do? So we got the pictures, which I love, the Instagram campaign, the showcasing, patients. What else could they have on there? There's a guy, a guy by the name of um, Nick Williamson. He was born with no arms and no legs. Oh, I've seen him, and he is, he's amazing. Yeah. So what can he do with that? He has an international audience, so you can go on his Facebook and his Twitter and everything, and you can post. They can post their needs. Excellent. Or, or maybe if they're doing good enough work, they can say, do you mind coming on and guest posting? Yeah, they can get people to come guest posts that are authorities and experts in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, what type of social media campaigns can they create? We already said the Instagram one, which I love. What else can they do? Think about all the different social media that we talked about. Yes? They could start a YouTube viral video campaign. That would work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing pulls at the heartstrings like a kid that, you know, and what they said in their presentation is that insurance companies won't pay for prosthetics for kids because kids outgrow them so quickly. So unless you can afford a prosthetic, like thousands of dollars, you're out of luck. So I mean, what great, great idea they are to be able to do this for kids. So I think they definitely pull up the heartstrings there to have that happen. What else? All right. So we said YouTube, Instagram. Maybe creating a hashtag that can be on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, and Facebook and Google Plus. Google Plus encourages hashtags. In fact, uh, if you don't use a hashtag on Google Plus, it says you're hurting it. That, that's no good to post. I don't know who. Oh, I know. Just look at that, Carolyn Caver. So you want to make sure she knows more about Google Plus than anybody I know. Outside of just doing things on social media, I feel like you can do like a lot of things where they can bring in a lot of the kids that don't that are missing, like limbs and things like that, and they can even make it like a PR event. I love it. Use their social media to back that up. Absolutely. So kind of like a tweet up or a right. meet up. They could, they could live it. stream it, have the interactive chat. Right. And they can even make it a big event. Like they can do something here, like um, we're gonna have limitless, limitless day. You know, like they could go anywhere with that. Yeah, I love that. Good, good. All right. So, um, what are some ways they can monetize? That was what they were struggling with. They said we don't feel right charging a kid who just lost his arm money. We don't want to make money off a kid that just lost his arm. So they got to monetize somewhere or else you can't stay afloat. you got taxes to pay and stuff like that. Definitely I mean, you got the lights on. The crowdfunding. Crowdfunding would definitely be a, a good way to do it. Now, would you do like a Kickstarter campaign where you get a huge amount to get yourself going? Or could you even do it kid by kid? Each kid has his own Kickstarter. Each kid, or if you want to house it on your site with that ignition deck. Yeah. <coughs> you guys have seen those the social media campaigns where my, my, my sister has a friend whose nephew is sick, and so we donate. You could um, get Marvel and other comics to sponsor a kid. And so basically, <laughs> what a great sponsorship thing. Yeah, that's awesome. You could do the Warby Parker model, too, or Tom's, where you like. Tell them what 
That is. Yeah, so uh, someone who can afford to buy one buys one, and that, that they pay like double, basically. And then someone who can't afford to get one for free. Yeah, that's awesome. Great idea. Anybody else? Um, maybe they could advertise on their prosthetics, like, some of the cool Like a Nike swoosh? Yeah, like a Nike swoosh. <laughs> They'll say, like, limit this, just do it, or don't ever. Under Armour when it's actually under. Yeah. Yeah, like, they can, they can, I mean, they don't have to hire a creative yeah. person to make Yeah. Yeah, great sponsorships that cross. Sponsored, make it cool. Do they own the 3D printing, or do they have to work with somebody to get the 3D? I don't know, because I was kind of in the back of the room. I kind of caught half of what they said. Anybody know? Um, they have their own 3D printer. <coughs> but mm -hmm. what they have the capability of doing is anyone that has a 3D printer, uh, no matter what size, they can give them parts to 3D print, and then those so then you're even assemble. really crowdsourcing the printing of it and the design of yeah, it. Yeah, which so. that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very very cool. Companies that make 3D print come to, like I was saying, meet lots of events, and then have them sponsor something. Kind of our make a rally for 3D yeah. printing at Prosthetic School. I think it's, like, their case is really interesting because it's two guys, and they were doing it for fun, and attention, they were on the Today Show and stuff, and now how did they capture yeah. that and that's while the building thing. their team? Because yeah. clearly they have other things to life. Entrepreneurship and startup at its best, definitely. So, like, instead of, like, a hackathon? Like a printathon? Yeah. 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 That'd be kind of yeah. cool. All right, so if you guys know them, pass along all these ideas to them. Because I seriously, I was fascinated with, with their, what they presented, so it was very cool. All right, I think my time is up. Any questions for me before we go? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Can I make sure they get tweet at me? There we go. There's all the places you can find me. And I'll be it's tweeting that, the yeah. selfie under best yeah. underscore hour. So. Yes. There you go. Thank you very much for coming out. If you guys would like free startup coaching, one of our fellows right here, you can see him or you can see me, and you can actually sign up for free starting coaching over here. If you would like to sign up for the newsletter to find out about more of these events before the entire campus finds out, you can sign up over here, and I'll get you on the newsletter. But before we do all that, we have a tradition. At the end of every single event, we head to the front and take an Instagram photo. Awesome. Yay! Let's do this. And we will tag whatever you would like. Um, tag best underscore hour. Yeah. There you go. Now, hello. 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 You walk up. What you, oh my god. <laughs> what are you bringing? That's a terrible Yeah, it is. I'm very terrible for a there's actually like we should talk let's let's brainstorm that's